All right, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panelists for participating in this event. Uh, so, you know, we know lots of new technologies go through what some people call hype cycles, uh, and blockchain was certainly one of them for a while. There was nothing blockchain couldn't do, including selling iced tea, um, and, you know, Bitcoin went to $18,000 per Bitcoin, um, and then they'll sort of that passed, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, and now we may be at the productive side of that so-called hype cycle, um, where people are actually figuring out what it's good for and what we can do with it, and policymakers are thinking about it in productive ways. Um, we had, for example, last week, the Colorado Digital Token Act was signed, uh, which defined a cryptocurrency for the state of Cal uh, Colorado, uh, said what rules apply to it and what didn't, um, and those are useful developments without saying anything about that particular law, particular law itself. People are talking about these issues in serious ways. And of course, I, I have to say that one of the biggest developments in cryptocurrency is that we have launched a TPI coin. It's the TPIX, um, just as a, uh, as a, as a preview. We, it's, it's live. Um, we'll be using it at our, at our Aspen event this summer, so um, be ready for that. Uh, but I'm just here mostly as the warm-up act and to introduce um, Sarah O, oh, who is the brains behind the coin and everything else, uh, lots of other things, not just crypto. Uh, she will be the moderator today. She organized this. She's a senior fellow at TPI, um, and I think one of the uh, smartest and most creative economists and lawyers working on policy issues today. Um, she has a BS in science and engineering from Stanford, a PhD in economics, and a JD from George Mason. And with that, I'll hand it over to her. Thanks, Scott. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Our program is called Blockchain 201, Policy Questions for 2019. And so we're hoping to elevate the discussion to kind of more advanced policy questions for Congress and um, regulatory agencies now that blockchain and cryptocurrencies are under um, kind of exciting development. It's beyond the hype cycle. And so um, I thought I would start by introducing our panelists. Um, we'll go through kind of a lightning round and I'll ask each of them um, to share two policy questions or policy priorities that they're focusing on um, this year for 2019. And then we'll discuss um, some questions um, that they might have and I have for them as well. Um, but just before um, I begin, here is um, here are our speakers. First, we have Daniel Gorfine. He's Chief Innovation Officer and Director of Lab CFTC at the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The Lab CFTC is dedicated to facilitating market-enhancing financial technology innovation and understanding of emerging technologies. So Lab CFTC has really been at the forefront of a lot of thinking um, from the federal government about um, crypto. Next, we have Jerry Brito. He's executive director of Coin Center, a nonprofit research and advocacy center focused on the public policy issues facing cryptocurrency technologies such as Bitcoin. And um, Coin Center really is at the leading edge of thinking about crypto um, currencies. Next, we have Marco Riley. Um, he's technology policy counsel in IBM's general counsel's office, worldwide government and regulatory affairs office. Um, and IBM's public sector and systems group, um, he's done a variety of sales management and executive positions. In his current position, Mark is responsible for a worldwide focus on emerging technology policy strategy and the support of strategic initiatives, including advanced computing and software um, platforms. And we have Diego Zuluaga, who's policy analyst at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, where he covers financial technology and consumer credit. And before joining Cato, Diego was head of financial services and tech policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. So um, before we go down the row and hear from each of our panelists, first, I just wanted to give a brief overview of what I take to be the state of blockchain um, and crypto in 2019. Um, so basically, right now, we're kind of in a crypto winter. Um, the hype for blockchain and crypto was really at the beginning of 2018. And now that prices are down and the, the bubble has burst, um, it, it's called a winter. But actually, there's a lot of exciting um, development and um, investment happening in this space. And so um, just from my own research and maybe from your own um, reading of the news, we've 
recently heard about um, private blockchains putting out products like the JP Morgan Chase coin where they're um, kind of redoing interbank settlement internally to try and um, shift away from the SWIFT network and to do um, their own in, um, interbank settlement. We've heard of other private investments in blockchain like IBM's Hyperledger and I read just yesterday that the French court system is using um, Hyperledger to register corporations um, over there. And on the public blockchain side um, for open protocols, I've just been doing research and learning about the um, OX um, different protocols where they're analogizing these um, different open protocols to like the early days of the internet, like SMTP allowed email or TCP IP allowed you know, packet exchange. And so these open protocols on, op um, on the blockchain are really going to enable connectivity that um, we haven't seen before. And that's very exciting. I mean, it's technical, but um, there is actual development happening that could really change the way um, people interact on the internet globally. Also on the public blockchain, um, I've just been learning about different applications on gaming. Um, and maybe you know about um, just the different types of tokens um, where you can have non-fungible like characters on your gaming systems um, like CryptoKitties. And so there are um, innovations happening in gaming that are very interesting. Um, you might also have heard of stable coins um, where there are fiat dollar backed coins um, that are tagged with the dollar. Um, and internationally, um, there's just a lot of competition. Um, Asia, if you just dig around, they have a lot um, of blockchain crypto um, development happening out of Singapore, Korea, China. So this really is kind of a global picture of crypto um, development and, and private blockchain development. So given that, um, I just wanted to go down the line and ask each um, panelist to describe their two top um, questions or policy priorities this year and maybe just try and keep it to a few minutes each and then we'll discuss more. Okay. Great, thank you and thanks for having me and all of us. Um, so I'll, I'll start a little bit higher level. I'm, I'll give some of the policy or market developments that you know we're taking a look at, but it not necessarily all exclusively something that the CFTC as an agency would would be focused on. Um, broadly, I think you're right on stable coins. You know, this is based on the fact that there has been a lot of price volatility, as you're all aware, in a lot of the early uh, crypto coins. Um, so there are many folks that are trying to think about ways you can create a more stable crypto asset that may be able to power a lot of the uh, networks that, that people are contemplating. Uh, the interesting angle there from a CFTC perspective, as you mentioned, yes, you can create stable coins that are anchored to a potential fiat currency, but you can also anchor with other types of physical assets like commodities. So, you know, certainly through our lab CFTC function, when we meet with folks, we are hearing a lot of hypotheticals around potential you know, anchoring of a crypto asset to gold or to other types of physical assets. And that could be, you know, depending on how those are structured, um, you can start to hear things that would come into CFTC world. For example, if there's a coin that's redeemable for kind of future delivery of a physical asset, that would be something that may satisfy the futures definition or a swap definition. Uh, so I agree, I think stable coins are pretty interesting. Um, the other big areas, look, I think as you also pointed out, the high water mark for, for uh, Bitcoin pricing at least was at the end of 2017, early 2018, and that caused this kind of deluge of, of projects and ICOs, and a lot of that was, was, seems to have been quite frothy. Um, I think a combination of CFTC and SEC you know, general guidance as well as some enforcement actions has chilled some of that extra froth. Um, that being said, I think this is going to be the year that you start seeing projects that are structured given existing guidance. So it'll be interesting to see what kinds of projects emerge. My last point, kind of shifting away from public blockchain to, to private, and I, I'm going to call this more broadly just distributed ledger technology. I think we saw, again, over the last couple of years, a lot of testing and pilots and proofs of concept of trying to use DLT as a way to make just private networks more efficient and enhance the efficiency of transactions. Um, but very little of that has scaled to date. 
Um, and it'll be interesting to see if folks are able to overcome technological barriers to scaling as well as justify kind of the upfront investment because it's a, it's a big investment to shift your existing computer architecture over to kind of these interoperable databases, which I'm sure Jerry will tell you are very different than kind of a, a public blockchain, but, but potentially inspired by that. There we go. Um, yeah, so as Dan was just mentioning, so Coin Center uh, is focused on open public uh, blockchain, so things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, and, and the like. Um, and the reason for that is that these networks, like the internet or like the web, um, are open and permissionless. Uh, they're public networks, and so as a result, they're, um, they're public goods. Um, anybody can use them without seeking anybody's permission. Um, if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you have an idea for a website uh, that you want to build called Facebook, um, you don't have to go to AOL and say, may I please build this thing and launch it. You can just launch it on the web and people can just come to it without any, any permission from anybody and uh, use it. And so uh, because it's open and permissionless and nobody owns it, um, uh, number one, that raises a lot of policy questions because a lot of uh, functions that uh, before these networks were done through intermediaries are now done in disintermediated fashion. Um, and so that raises policy questions because those intermediaries uh, usually tend to be regulated. And now there is no intermediary um, to, to be regulated. Um, and secondly, because, uh, because these networks are open and permissionless and nobody owns them, you need, um, I think, a uh, nonprofit public advocate for uh, these networks. Um, and what we advocate for is, uh, number one, the freedom for users to use these networks, um, and number two, uh, that where government regulation is appropriate, and there are many uh, uh, areas where it is appropriate, that it be thoughtful and it be done in such a way uh, that it not affect the continued development of the technology. Uh, so that's what Coin Center does, and as far as policy issues that we're looking at, um, so over the past couple years, uh, probably one of our top issues has been um, securities regulation. Um, so th uh, there's a question of you have all these different kinds of tokens. Um, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Ethereum, then you've got tokens that run on top of Ethereum like TPIX. Um, what are these things? Are they currencies? Are they commodities? Are they securities? Are, what are they? Um, and one question has been, are these things securities or not? Um, and that has been a question that's been pretty open, but <coughs> over the last um, 12 months, um, at, uh, 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 at least, we've gotten a lot of good clarity on that. Um, and so now um, we can say with um, pretty relative certainty that Bitcoin's not a security, Ethereum's not a security. These things are um, pretty clearly commodity, given that commodities are, is a very broad um, definition. Um, and that gives us a lot of certainty. Um, so as a result, um, uh, you know, there's still a lot of open questions related to securities or to the SEC. So, for example, um, how do we get a Bitcoin ETF? Um, uh, there are ETFs for much more exotic and volatile goods out there. Um, how do we get a Bitcoin ETF or an Ethereum ETF? There are questions about how do you custody uh, these things to be in compliance? So if you are a uh, venture capital fund or a hedge fund and you want to hold uh, cryptocurrency along with other uh, other things like securities or commodities, um, how do you do that in a compliant way? So that while those are still open questions, um, at Coin Center at least, looking um, uh, for the broader uh, interest of pu public networks, we think we've gotten some pretty good clarity that public decentralized functional networks, not securities. So that freezes up and being crypto winter, um, this is not my first crypto winter. Uh, crypto winter is a great time because developers get to develop and be heads down on, on the work and they build really great things. And folks like us get to focus on sort of long-term policy uh, thinking. And so for us, the two big issues are, number one, privacy. Um, so increasingly, um, the, these networks are being built to be uh, more and more private. And so that raises all kinds of policy questions. And so we're, we've been looking at that. Um, and what are, um, uh, so number one, making the case that um, uh, more private cryptocurrency is socially beneficial, and number two, what uh, are uh, the appropriate policy uh, responses to more private cryptocurrency, and what are the constitutional limits to what a regulatory approach could be. And then the second thing is tax. Um, 
there are any number of open tax questions um, that the IRS has not answered and that um, it would be relatively simple for them to answer. Um, some might require congressional action, and so we're, um, we're looking at getting some answers to those. So those are kind of what we're working on right now. Good afternoon to everyone. I, I think Nan and Jerry have taken my thunder and <laughs> pointed out my questions. Uh, IBM focuses more on private blockchains and enterprise blockchains. Is that better? Yeah. It focuses more on private and uh, enterprise blockchains. But some of the policy questions um, that we face are similar to what you're facing in the crypto arena. Uh, we are, depending upon the industry, concerned about regulatory certainty as to how a business should act and react in the utilization of a blockchain, particularly when you're dealing in global markets and our customers are going from country to country with their business transactions. They need certainty as to how they act, leaving the United States, how they will be received in another country, uh, and vice versa. So uh, our question always becomes one of dealing with, and I, I want to put this to you all as staff, we're looking for ongoing discussions, right, when it comes to policy and understanding distributed ledger technology, be it public or private. We think we're in the same basket. Uh, we don't think it's enough to just have one discussion and walk away for a couple of months and a bad thing happens on either side and everybody wants to run and have a hearing and talk about it. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned, I deal in emerging tech for the company, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, last year, this Congress passed a law in quantum computing, a bill. When you look at it in detail, they passed the entire ecosystem. They talk about development from soup to nuts. They talk about all the considerations in between from NIST and standards, from the National Science Foundation and to the Department of Energy. So they left no stone unturned that has to be considered to make the process complete. It's the same thing that they're doing with artificial intelligence, no stone unturned. And that's the same thing we're looking for in, in distributed ledger technology. We think you have to look at the whole of the network, how it's applied, be it public or private, and so that anybody who enters into this business, including our clients, can have some certainty that when they do certain things, be it a smart contract or deal with a coin, that they're gonna be treated in a certain way. Tax questions are obvious, how is that coin treated? They all want to know when they engage within the business that they're following the letter of the law, but they're not necessarily saying regulate, right? They would rather have open dialogue and discussions to talk about guidelines and positions. As position papers you all put out, that helps. And I'll tell you uh, the challenge you have when you regulate, and you all heard of GDPR, right? The Europeans put up that privacy legislation and immediately my colleague in Brussels says the first headache they had was how do I apply it to blockchain, right? It doesn't work. So now they're having to go back and figure out how do I justify saying you have the right to be forgotten, but in a blockchain, I can't take the data out because you defeat the purpose of the chain. So that's an example of if you rush to regulate and not really understand what you're dealing with, you can have a bigger problem on the backside. So that's the, that's the position we're in. Thank you. Um, yeah, I concur with much of what has been said. I would say my two policy priorities for 2019 as far as crypto and blockchain are concerned are payments and money transmission and then financial privacy, which is, I think, something that we uh, are all concerned about and share. And the reason those are my two priorities is that I think those two areas have been neglected by policymakers over the years. And we have a lot of um, legacy regulation from another era that hasn't been looked at enough. And that is, if you look at surveys, if you look at assessments of the cost of complying with them and the effectiveness of that regulation, they don't look very good at all. I'm thinking about the Bank Secrecy Act and AML regulation when it comes to financial privacy. And when I think about that question with regard to decentralized networks, the immediate point that comes to mind is that regulators are uncomfortable uh, allowing privacy in a network that nobody owns. Because for a long time, uh, privacy legislation or sort of bank secrecy, privacy sort of undermining uh, for hopefully for the public good, but still undermining legislation has relied on an entity that has liability, whether it's a bank or a money services business or a broker dealer, they are the ones providing the data, collecting the data, and the ones who are liable if something bad happens. Now, to an extent, that's already happening in the crypto world with exchanges, 
and other venues that have to collect certain customer information. But if we're talking about dealing in a decentralized way and users having at least the ability to engage with these networks independently, then the question of privacy that Jerry was raising becomes very interesting and one that I think we're going to have to fight hard because working in financial regulation, cost-benefit analysis is something that is gradually seeping into regulators' minds, but when it comes to national security and terrorism issues, uh, it is very difficult to get across the notion that there is a limit to how much information you can demand from people, uh, even when we're very concerned about what the deleterious consequences from not having enough information might be. It's a tough question, but we have to address it, and it's a major, major issue in financial regulation. And then as far as payments and money transmission, my main concern there is that we are, through regulation, uh, impairing financial inclusion because a lot of our money licensing laws at the state level, a lot of our data access laws, and uh, the operation of banks and money services of payment systems fall hardest on the poor because they're the ones who are at the limit, living paycheck to paycheck, have to pay the fees of a clunky payment system that takes two days for funds to come through, have to pay the cost of monopolistic systems that because of licensing or other anti-competitive rules make it difficult for new entrants to come in. And you know, at the end of it, some of the projects that are uh, involved in cryptocurrency um, are trying to provide payments. And to the extent we don't know what these tokens are going to be regulated as, they have some of, somewhat of an inability in serving the retail customer. I'm thinking of projects like Ripple or other, you know, it's not the only one, but other payments uh, projects. I mean, Bitcoin itself is, is mainly a, a payments uh, network. And so um, I think to the extent that we can allow uh, more easy provision of these services by decentralized networks, we're increasing competition, uh, we are putting pressure on regimes that are very fragmented across the United States in terms of allowing uh, these businesses to operate. And we are creating an opportunity for, say, people sending remittances abroad, people trying to get money to their relatives in another country sending funds abroad uh, to do so more cheaply and faster than they currently are. And I think that technology is available, and it's mostly a regulatory question. So financial privacy, payments, and money transmission. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for um, teeing up those topics. So I thought we could just um, proceed with our discussion in two buckets. Um, we talked about privacy and we, we also talked about money transmission laws and fi traditional financial questions. Um, they're both very exciting. So um, I think maybe the first um, we can address is money and then we can go to privacy. Um, so in Colorado, for example, the Digital Token Act exempts um, crypto assets, I believe, I, um, you can correct me, from um, state money transmission laws because they're um, crypto assets and they're not considered um, money. And, and there is um, kind of mature thinking that custodial um, firms are under the Bank Secrecy Act laws. So if, if some firms like Coinbase, if they are holding dollars and crypto, um, they're regulated like a bank, but then non-custodial exchanges where, um, and Jerry might correct me, um, are not engaged in um, money transmission, and so they're exempted. Um, is that correct uh, in thinking about um, custodial versus non-custodial exchanges and then um, the treatment of crypto assets? Sure. So I'm not sure about Colorado specifically, but um, the way states look at this um, typically is if you are in the business of holding funds for customers um, and you're not a bank, banks are regulated separately, but if you're PayPal or Western Union or Coinbase and you're holding funds for customers, um, even if it's for a brief period of time, so you're Western Union and it's between the time that you hand it over and your brother across the country picks it up, right? Um, when you're holding those funds, you're putting the customer at risk because you can lose those funds, you can run away with the funds, you can be hacked, right? And so um, that custody aspect um, creates uh, a risk that the state addresses through licensing. Um, in some states, and the thing to say though is that this is a state-by-state -state regulation, right? And if you are um, a business that provides this kind of service, you have to get a license in every state in which you do business. So over 50 states and territories require this. Um, and they all have different um, uh, standards and different uh, uh, um, ways of complying. Um, some states have basically said that cryptocurrency and crypto assets are not funds under the definition. And so as long as you are only dealing in crypto and not in dollars, 
you don't have to get a license. That's just a few states. Most states do treat it um, uh, as funds, and so you do have to get um, a license. Um, the main issue there is getting more clarity about how it applies to cryptocurrency firms. Um, and I can go into detail about that if you want. As far as the Bank Secrecy Act goes, um, the Bank Secrecy Act basically requires financial institutions um, to register with FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at Treasury, um, and to um, know their customers, so collect information about your customers, and file suspicious activity reports and other, uh, re retain information, et cetera. Um, so the question is, are you a financial institution? If you, uh, a financial institution is defined in the rules um, as somebody who uh, accepts and transmits funds on behalf of a customer, uh, which means that you're custodial, right? If you're accepting and transmitting, you had custody for that period of time. So custodial firms are subject to the Bank Secrecy Act. If you are in the business of providing software that customers can use to transmit funds, but you're not doing the transmission, you're not custodial. You never have access to the fund. And so as a result, you're not um, subject to the Bank Secrecy Act. And you should not be subject to state money transmission licensing, although in some states, uh, it's funny, it's not called money custody licensing, it's called money transmission licensing. And uh, the way the statutes are written are, if you are in the business of transmitting funds, you need to get licensed. Why is it written that way? Why isn't it money, cu if custody is the risk that require that is a policy rationale for the license, why is it money transmission licensing instead of money custody licensing? It's simply because these laws were written in the 60s and 70s before the invention of Bitcoin. And before the invention of Bitcoin, the only way that you could transmit funds was by necessarily taking custody of it. But today, these laws, you read them and it says, if you're in the business of transmitting funds, you have to get licensed. And you look up, well, what does transmitting mean in the definitions? And transmitting means sending by any means. Or, or it's a, it's so basically, you could be providing simply software, never having custody of consumer funds, but you technically could be transmitting. Um, it's never really become a, a big issue um, uh, that's been enforced against pure software providers, but it's a real big ambiguity that exists. Yeah, so just one, one point to add on this. I, I think what's making this really tricky is the, is the dual nature of the way certain crypto assets to date have either been traded or utilized, and let me unpack that a little bit. So you've got capital markets regulators that think about market activity and trading. And then you have kind of the retail banking regulators that think about things like deposits and payments. So picture what's happening right now in capital markets world from either an SEC or CFTC perspective. We have kind of a traditional sense of what's supposed to happen to assets that are part of transactions. So you'll hear this term that's kind of come out of the, the securities framework, the so-called qualified custodian. Qualified custodians are these intermediaries that the, the securities markets have utilized to hold assets that are part of securities transactions. You know, in CFTC world, it's kind of a really interesting landscape because we're dealing with commodities. So when you're dealing with commodities, the, the way that commodities were traditionally custodied or warehoused was quite varied. I mean, if you're dealing with things like corn and wheat, you're literally talking about warehouses where those types of custodians. So you, you have the capital markets regulators thinking about custody or safeguarding of assets in a certain way. But then what's happening, I think, is that these instruments may become part of trading activity. It's occurring within capital markets. But then the next day, you could be turning around and using it potentially as a payment mechanism. And as soon as you do that, you're starting to think, well, wait a minute. We're back in the world of payments and banks and trusts. That's, I think, the state of play and where there's a lot of, uh, you know, I don't even want to say confusion, but people are working through that. Certainly this topic of custody has become a big policy and market issue over the last, you know, six or so months because I think a lot of institutional capital that wanted to start to participate in the space, they have rules that say you can only be parking your assets with a so-called qualified custodian, this concept that comes out of that securities, uh, securities markets. And then everyone's trying to figure out, well, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean a traditional broker dealer that's regulated by the SEC and FINRA? Is that, is that gonna be a place where we feel comfortable? Should it be at a bank? Should it be at a trust? Where, where does it fit? Um, some of it may end up, you know, I, and, and again, these are, I should say, these are all my personal views. I mean, I think some of this may sort by the way the market moves. I, I suspect that, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, you've had increased clarity as, a, uh, as to, you know, maybe what's a security, what's not.
you may get the tokenization of securities, but that might get applied through a very kind of traditional lens of securities markets. So some of this may become less of an issue if that's how the market evolves. If it doesn't, if I'm wrong, and this stuff really does continue to play this role where it could be in the capital markets one day and then in kind of traditional banking and payments the next, these are tough questions. take a, a little bit different twist, but similar, and, and Jerry and I talked about this early on. Uh, for our company, we build the networks, right? And we service the networks. And the question we run into, as you alluded to, is as a builder and servicer of the network, what is your liability for a transaction on that network? Which we don't have clarity on at this point. So uh, I'm speaking not just for a position of IBM, but anyone who is a software provider that builds an infrastructure and supports it also would need some clarity as to what their responsibilities are for once something breaks on that network or something goes wrong, what are we held accountable for? Just a brief comment because, uh, you know, I, I work in a libertarian think tank and we don't particularly like centralization. Um, so when I make the point about money transmitter laws being fragmented, people bring up the point about regulatory competition between states and, you know, how it's good to have laboratories of democracy and so on. And I acknowledge that point, but I think in the case of crypto assets and in the case of money transmitter law fragmentation in the states, we don't really have that laboratory of democracy. We have a mechanism by which states have a nice revenue source from licensing on such a basis. And that creates a barrier to entry for operators who um, are by definition borderless, may have few customers, but they're distributed all across the geography of the United States. And that kind of structure makes it difficult for them to operate if we have that kind of system. Now, what a lot of us have in mind, certainly that would be my suggestion, is something akin to what we have for bank licensing, meaning that you have some sort of national bank license and you have the option of a state bank license if you like that better. In terms of money transmission, you, have, you would have something similar. No one is forced to go to the federal uh, alternative, but there is a federal alternative for those people who have that kind of business model. And to me, it seems like the not only the least costly way, uh, but one that overcomes some of the political issues about revenue raising versus creating barriers versus promoting competition, which uh, states run up against all the time. Can I add something to that? Um, and uh, I totally agree with that. I think the one area where you need, where it be, should be super easy to get immediate certainty is non-custodial uh, uses of cryptocurrency. So if it's non-custodial, if you're providing a service um, that's purely software-based, um, and you're never taking custody of consumer funds, crypto or otherwise, so you cannot possibly lose it or run away with it, you're not presenting a risk, you sh there should be no question about whether you have to get a license or not. Um, and so one way to address that from the federal level uh, is what Representative Emmer uh, has introduced, which is the uh, uh, Cryptocurrency uh, Regulatory Certainty Act. I think that's what it's called, Landon. Blockchain Certainty, Regulatory Certainty Act. Um, and what it would do is basically say, hey, state money transmission regulators, you're doing a terrific job uh, regulating uh, um, uh, custodians of consumer funds, but here's a, here's a set of actors who never pose a risk to consumers because they never hold um, funds, so uh, you may not require a license from this set of folks. And that is very targeted, very reasonable uh, preemption of state money transmission licensing, which um, I think is just fantastic. Um, great, and as a kind of follow-up question about stable coins, and um, there are some innovations about um, collateralized loan obligations off of crypto assets. Um, would that fall into a bucket of non-custodial exchange if you're trading a stable coin um, that's fiat-backed? So I guess that question um, is two parts. One. What are the rules of stable coins, um, firstly? Um, are they pretty much money market accounts um, that are backed by reserves in a qualified bank um, in order to peg a, co a stable coin to the dollar? Um, and two, um, would that stable coin be considered, if it's exchanged, and let's say if lending happens with it, um, is that considered a non-custodial exchange because it's a coin by um, a company that doesn't hold funds. 
Yeah. I mean, I can start, I can start with the, the wonderful uh, regulatory uh, response to that, which is it's going to depend, and it's facts and circumstances. But let me actually unpack that, because that's an easy throwaway statement. But it's true. I mean, so when people, and I mentioned this at the outset, when you talk about stable coins, the devil really is in the detail as to how you're structuring it. I mean, it, it, so you can envision a world where, as you just said, it's, you, could, you, could, you could make an argument some of this starts to sound a little bit like a traditional money market fund where you're, tr you're actually issuing what seems like a share in response for a dollar and you're hoping to maintain that mark. That's an interesting um, uh, way to shape it. Others are when we get into whether it's dollars or, again, physical commodities. I mean, you know, the idea of backing it with gold, something else to make it stable. It's really going to depend on what that means. Are you tokenizing? specific ownership over gold, so just digitizing your, your warehouse receipt effectively, or are you saying that, you know, we've got this warehouse and you can come and bring this and, and, and we'll deliver that gold to you at some point in time, Th that those details really will matter. So I don't think it's easy to, to answer that question right now, but most likely these different permutations I think will fit within some existing regulatory box. And it may just be that you're just digitizing or tokenizing ownership, in which case that looks like, a, at least if you're dealing with physical commodities, that's a spot market. That becomes a cash market, which uh, is not really regulated at the federal level, at least from an oversight perspective. Um, so when talking about stable coins, it's important to, uh, de details really matter, and it's important to, to ask what we're talking about. So first of all, there, um, I would say there are two bro broad classes of stable coins. There are what I would call algorithmic stable coins, and then there are fiat-backed stable coins. So fiat-backed stable coins is basically you have a firm. Uh, the firm um, will take a dollar from you and create, at that point, issue a dollar token and give it to you. Uh, and then in the future, they are happy to redeem that dollar token for a dollar. Uh, so, and so basically that's kind of a centralized model where you have a firm that is holding dollars. Uh, and then the question is about how they do that and under what um, uh, legal umbrella. Then you have algorithmic stable coins where you don't have a firm um, uh, necessarily. Um, and basically you, using a series of smart contracts, um, you can uh, lock up capital using other assets, so for example, Ethereum, and um, uh, through different market me mechanisms and incentives, um, uh, you create a token that should remain stable, uh, or, or basically a, a token that uh, maintains parity, price, you know, pr purchasing parity with the dollar. Um, I'm a little skeptical about um, the feasibility of a completely algorithmic stable coin, um, but Anyway, those are the two ways you can do it. I think you're asking about the fiat backed. And as far as the fiat backed ones go, I th there are any number of different um, companies that are um, uh, doing it this, and they're doing it under different um, legal theories. I think some of the most interesting ones uh, are things like Paxos or Gemini Dollar, where basically they are New York State um, uh, trusts. Um, that uh, have had the product approved by the Department of Financial Services um, and have acquired a bit license. Um, and basically, they keep a dollar in trust um, for every token that they issue. Um, uh, so that's one. Uh, then you have things like uh, True USD, which is a token that's being issued by a company called Trust Token. And they do something very similar, but instead of a trust, what they use are escrow accounts at different banks. Um, so they can't touch the dollars, the dollars are held in escrow for the customer. So as the customer goes to any one of the different banking partners, deposits dollars, and a trust token will issue them a true USD token. Um, then you have other um, stable coins where there's a company, you give them dollars and they give you a token and query what they're doing. Um, uh, you know, so uh, there are lots of different ways that this is happening. Okay, any final thoughts about money? Transmission. Okay, and um, can we talk about JPM coin at some point? <laughs> yeah, why don't we transfer to um, private blockchain and then privacy? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are two thoughts I wanted to raise which didn't really fit my two priorities earlier. So, you know, I wanted at some point to get the opportunity to do it. And uh, the first is I made the, this point about how this technology allows us to overcome, just like mobile, mobile phone technology made it possible to overcome the natural monopoly issue with landlines, where you would have a single provider that was regulated like a utility by the government. Um, I feel like in, for example, transactions clearing and settlement, we can move from a model that is quite centralized that emerged, it's a model of its time from the late 60s, early 70s, in terms of how transactions are processed and, you know, um, rather than mailing people their security deposit certificates uh, every time they engage in a transaction, a centralized body would take account of all that information and either net it out or, you know, keep account of it in some way. And because of the cost structure of that business, you know, it made sense to have only one or a few in a very large uh, jurisdiction. I don't think that is as much the case now that we have decentralized networks emerging, and so we can overcome the liability side of having a single provider, which is you don't get as much innovation and competition and perhaps as much of a downward trend in prices as you do in a competitive environment. And JPM coin I see as potentially uh, an evolution of this, because it's supposed to be initially an internal database system for JP Morgan, right? I mean, when I saw the news, I didn't even see what the coin was. You know, people say sometimes that crypto projects are scammy. Well, you know, I mean, J JP Morgan is telling us they have a coin, and what is the coin? I mean, as far as I can tell, it's, it's an account management system for their institutional clients, which is great. I'm all in favor of it, but, you know, it seems like a bit of marketing there. Now, my point being that because JP Morgan is so large, when they start having something like this for themselves, it may make sense for the smaller guys to deal via JP Morgan because the marginal cost of serving them is quite low. And so that creates an alternative uh, record keeping mechanism that is privately provided <coughs> by a firm that already has all of the, hopefully a lot of the required licensing and, uh, and can compete with existing firms in a, in a different way. So that, that I think is the, the exciting development here. Yeah, yeah I mean, just to jump off of that, I mean, I, I do think we talked before about DLT and I refer to that kind of as distributed ledger technology that's been inspired by blockchain. And the reality is that is that Bitcoin has made this topic of like interoperable databases an actual hot topic, which is somewhat humorous, because I mean, this is back office stuff that we're talking about, but potentially very compelling. And, and, and I think that your point is exactly right. It seems to me that everybody's starting to realize the benefits of having kind of standardized data formats fields that could be interoperable. You can increase the size of those permissioned private networks, but that can drive large efficiency gains. So. You know, maybe it's not revolutionary, maybe it's evolutionary, but I think it's it's significant. So I, I completely agree. I think that's a good way to bridge from the, the public blockchains to what that's inspiring within uh, the private context. Can I um, just make the pitch for open public networks uh, for a minute? And just say this, that without taking anything away from like what JPM coin is doing, because it's, you know, it makes perfect sense for them, right? They can create, you know, uh, it's basically an evolution of interbank settlement. Um, and given their size, you know, they, they're going to um, uh, cover a lot of territory. But at the end of the day, it all goes through J.P. Morgan. They own it, which is fine. It's, it's terrific. Um, but I think where the real revolution is, is imagine a world where you can have competition among firms that will offer stable coins that are fiat-backed. So, you know, you might even have the Fed issue a, a, a coin or different companies around the world. And, um, but these are all a standard token on an open public permissionless network that nobody owns, right? So today I've got Apple Pay on my phone. And if I send a dollar to Dan, on, I see on his iPhone, um, he's now got a dollar. Actually, Apple's holding that dollar. Um, and he can send it to somebody else, and Apple is always holding it. If you want to send that to somebody using an Android phone, you can't, right? Because it's a closed network. You can send, the dollar, your Apple Pay dollar, you can send it to anybody in the world as long as they are using Apple. Imagine a, and you've got these silos, right? And you've got the Android, and then you've got, so with JPM coin, it might reach big scale, might even begin to have retail use, but you're gonna end up with a couple of, um, uh, basically, uh, you're gonna end up with, a, with an oligopoly of a few, um, which is fine, that's, that's, but wouldn't it be neat if we had an open standard where anybody could issue basically dollar tokens as long as they're using this dollar standard, um, uh, and then I could send that token to anybody who has, as long as they have an Ethereum wallet, which is, there are gonna be many competing Ethereum wallets as long as they all publish to the same standard. It's kind of like email, right? 
email is an open standard. Um, you use Gmail, I use Yahoo, you run your own email server, but we can all email each other. It's better than having, imagine a world of a few years ago where you had basically AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy. And if you were on AOL, you could email anybody in the world as long as they were, they were also on AOL. Right? It's better to have email, which is an open protocol. Great. So now that um, we've talked about money and about open protocols, how about some more thorny questions about privacy? So Mark raised the interesting point about GDPR and blockchain. So how do you um, change a blockchain to comply with GDPR? How does GDPR adapt to blockchain? And I, I think that's the debate they're having in Brussels today. It's, it's, it's almost like a famous word, oops moment. All right, look what I did, and then, oh no, look what I did. All right, and, and that's what's happening. Um, I, let me just digress a little bit on the, on the private blockchain. Um, the, the activities that we see and the companies that we work with, the clients that we work with, uh, regardless of the staffers that are in here, whatever uh, area you support, um, the requirements of whoever is within that industry sit with you. So we talked about agriculture, right? And we talked about uh, private blockchains in agriculture, right? I will take uh, Food Trust as an example. Um, we're working with Walmart on a Food Trust network from farm to fork. And one of the biggest challenges they have, one, is making sure they keep all parties on the network agreeable. Two, how do we deal with government regulations, right, in country, regardless of where we're shipping the product, to be sure that we're following all of these regulations, right? When you talk about privacy of information, <laughs> it's interesting to hear that uh, and as, as I talk to representatives from different companies, some companies don't want the government on their network looking at their data, right? And I alluded to earlier, and my argument is if you have an emergency, um, and you, you ought to be able to break glass, let the government come in and see what they need to see on the data. I'm not saying Walmart's one of them, they're not. Um, they understand the importance of having government engagement. But for you all, as you do agriculture, as you do financial services, um, as you touch commerce and supply chain, you really need to be cognizant of what the rules of the road are within that industry domestically and what the rules of the road are to impact U.S. businesses as they go international. Now, I'll, I'll take um, two examples of situations that what we're running into. Uh, China last year sent out draft legislation uh, they say was on their public blockchain that said they want to be able to enter into that blockchain at any time to see what's going on in that blockchain, right? They want to know who the participants on that blockchain are down to your mobile number, okay? We wrote a response to that to say that's a chilling effect to, a, 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 to any network, be it public or private. That's not what business should be about. And from a business perspective, even though they say this was not a, impacting a private network, you become uncomfortable in business knowing that the environment could one day turn that way towards how you do business. That's one extreme. Uh, I, th I think a more meaningful process that's going on right now um, in the European Union, and I hate acronyms, INATB is the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications, right? Where the European Union has gathered business entities who are not technology companies, plus technology companies together, and say in a pan-European framework, what considerations what we should take into account to build an effective blockchain network. Their point is that not regulation, but guidelines and rails, ongoing discussions. Uh, we, we join that discussion with them, and we see it as a positive step, and I, I try to tell folks here as I introduced it today, that that type of discussion on this side of the pond can make distributed ledger technology that much more effective. Now, I know I'm giving Dan a lot of work to do on an ongoing discussion, but uh, as Jerry and I come from different worlds, we have to be together in this type of discussion to make us more effective. So when you talk about privacy, these are the types of things um, that we think we need to take into consideration and avoid the extremes of a security nation on one side and look at reasonable privacy on the other side. I, I just have uh, one thought that came to mind 
after Jerry spoke and then Mark, because one of the things that I see emerging as, as something that will determine how much public blockchains dominate over private blockchains is people's preferences over immutability and privacy. Because most people, I mean, a libertarian like me values privacy a lot and autonomy a lot. So I'm very much a public blockchain kind of guy just because of my preferences. But I can see how a lot of people would rather rely on a system where bad decisions can be altered, where if someone makes a mistake, there's a central authority that can change the ledger, and perhaps even where they can acquire the right to be forgotten in some sort of way. And I think in those cases, a private blockchain is perhaps more suitable for them. And so it will be, you know, obviously government intervention will have a big impact on this because it, de you know, it depends on the choice that you're given. And if governments make it very difficult, as in China, uh, for privacy to actually be an option that you can choose from, uh, then we won't have that. But even in a, what I'm getting at is that even in an open and free market, we may well get a situation where private blockchains are what's optimal for most people who um, don't mind having someone have oversight over their stuff, don't mind uh, paying a little bit extra to a central authority, uh, who want to have that, who, who don't want that immutability as, as a sort of determinant of the future forevermore. Just a thought. I mean, it's not, it's not my preference, but you know, I think that makes sense. Uh, so I completely agree with that. Um, I think that uh, for most people in most applications, they might use a private blockchain or just a regular database, and it makes perfect sense. But the important thing is that we keep always an option on the table, the ability to use an immutable and private network um, because it's an escape valve. That, and, it's, and it's the escape valve that allows for us to have an open society. Without that escape valve, you have a completely intermediated society where all transactions have to go th through an intermediary um, that is either a corporate intermediary that is one of a few, um, that has control over what, you know, that they can see what you're doing and have control over what you're doing, and one that can always be co-opted or directly owned by the government. And so let me give you, let me just quickly talk about immutability or censorship resistance first, and then I'll talk about privacy, and in the context of China. So in China, um, a little while ago, um, there was a scandal with uh, vaccines, where there were a few factories um, that produced vaccines um, that made people very sick. A lot of people were hurt. Um, and so different bloggers around the country were raising the alarm about this. And they were blogging about it or writing about it in WeChat. And any time they would write about it, it immediately would be taken down. Because where were they posting this? They were posting this to, central inter you know, to centralized intermediaries, who, which are the, the platforms. And the government basically controls those. Uh, so what did they do? Very simple. They took the blog post and they put it into a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain. You can't take it down. It's there. You know, you have to get through the firewall, to, through a great firewall to have access to it. But once you, you do that, the message is there and um, uh, it can be seen and it can never be taken down. And to me, that's a feature. It's not a bug. And the right to be forgotten, um, uh, uh, y you just can't have a blockchain, a, a public blockchain that can comply with, with that. Um, and I think it, it, to the extent the European Union insists on keeping the law as is, they're basically banning the use of open public blockchains in Europe, uh, and I think they will be hurt economically uh, if they insist to do, uh, doing that. So having completely immutable, or as immutable as you can get blockchains, I think is a feature, not a bug. And then you have privacy. So again, take China. Um, China has gone from a, over the past decade from a country where um, people use cash as the main form of payment, paper cash, to a country where cash is barely seen. You go to China, you try to pay with paper notes, they look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there are QR codes. And basically there are two apps, uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay. Um, and all transactions go through that. Um, and what that means is that um, these two companies, which uh, I'll say are closely linked to the Chinese government, um, they can see what you're doing and they know everything about you and um, the speeds uh, into the social credit score system that China's developing. And so what that means is, is that you'll be assigned a score based on, so if you, in, uh, in a paper that I wrote recently that I encourage you all uh, to, look, um, uh, to look at, um, I, I cite um, a WeChat pay or as an Alipay executive who talks about this, and he says, yeah, you know, if you are buying a lot of video games um, and potato chips and things like that, you're probably not a very socially uh, productive person. So you get a lesser score, and you're buying a lot of diapers, and, uh, and you're probably a mother, and you're probably going to be. So 
Uh, and the more chilling thing is this, is that in a world that's completely cashless, where you have no access to person-to-person -person cash that is censorship resistant and private, what this means is that the intermediary, whether it's a corporation or uh, the state via a corporation, can turn you off. They can say, and this happens in China, um, you can no longer buy plane tickets. You're not allowed to fly anywhere. Um, or they can say, you're just turned off um, until you turn yourself into the authorities. Think about it. If you have no cash and all your payments have to go through this and they turn you off, what do you do? So we need to keep money, a version of money that is, as we move to a more digital world uh, where there's more electronic commerce and, and, and paper money goes away, we need to keep a version of cash that is person to person, that is censorship resistant, and that is private. And that's what electronic cash, like uh, uh, these open public blockchains are. So, so I'm going to quadruple down, <laughs> by the way, on this public versus private blockchain first and just make the point, yes, these are not mutually exclusive concepts. And I, you know, from, from my perspective, seeing both of them kind of evolve and see where different innovations take place, I think, is a positive thing. I personally think that there are certain areas where private blockchains may have at least a technological advantage for now. S perhaps that's surmounted by some public blockchains, but maybe not. I mean, it also depends how many areas public blockchains will completely make sense. Um, I, I got to pose one question to Jerry, and then I will go over to privacy. But you know, it's interesting. So I was thinking about it. You're talking about the right to be forgotten, and that tends to be something that that is actually a very strong kind of privacy advocate's position, right? That people shouldn't don't are afraid of having certain information that's just kept in whatever repository, whether it's a government that holds it or otherwise. So my my question for you is going to be, what about in the, the context of like defamation? So imagine someone starts posting to the public blockchain ridiculously ridiculous falsehoods about you, mm -hmm. but now you can never take that down. Maybe it's because I just watched that movie yesterday, The Circle, or In the Circle, or whatever that's called. It's got me thinking like this. But but how do you solve for that kind of privacy concern with a public blockchain? So I wouldn't call that a privacy concern. Um, that is a, more of a defamation uh, kind of concern. And there are all kind, there's all kinds of information that we would want the ability to take down. And you can't with this data. And so you don't solve for it. You don't solve for it that way. Um, it's, it's something that you're going to have to make a decision. Is this socially beneficial? Are the socially beneficial uses outweigh the cost? And there are costs. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that, you, you're right, that is, um, that is a fact. Yeah. So, and then I'll shift over to privacy and, and you know, give a, at least a little bit of a perspective from, from a regulatory view. You know, to be, to be blunt, when we first started hearing about things like uh, Monero and, and Zcash, these are, these are you know, perceived anonymity coins, right? From a regulatory perspective, as you can imagine, that's quite troubling at first blush because you're going to look at it and say, "Well, wait a minute. I mean, how are people transacting?" And I've all and and then look, I've made the argument before too that the the best anonymous tool is actually cash, right? People can exchange a briefcase of cash, and that's completely anonymous. Then again, I'm I'm willing to concede when you're talking about digital transactions and the amounts of money you could move and the types of uh, 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 transactions you may be able to engage in, it's certainly facilitated by digital. So I think there are some distinctions. But it's a real challenge because, you know, at the end of the day, we do have the Bank Secrecy Act, we have anti-money laundering, know your customer requirements, and for good reason, right? The, you, the last thing we want to be seeing is this turning into a tool or a mechanism uh, for terrorists to use or other types of illicit purposes. Um, so it, it, it's going to be a real challenge to figure out how do we apply in kind of a modern way the, the, the purposes or the requirements of, of, of BSA and AML. Um, I, I'm willing to concede that my, my knee jerk was, man, that's going to be a real problem. But then you flip around and look at what the technology is trying to accomplish. It's likely that some of the protocols that drive this are going to allow you to kind of think about encrypting medical records. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be able to transfer your medical records on a public blockchain, in an encrypted private way, some of these technologies may help to advance some of that development as well. So I'm not an expert in BSA AML. I can tell you that it is a real concern and a real challenge because if, if, if it's utilized for, for harm, it's going to be very difficult to see a, a non very strong kind of government or regulatory response, um, but also trying to recognize, yes, there are real reasons why some of the software that's being programmed, it's really interesting what it can do. Yeah. So I. Let me just say that I completely agree with you that there is uh, a potential that this technology is going to be used for uh, illicit purposes and all kinds of criminal activity that's going to be harmful, just like the internet can be used, just like cars, right? So the, the, 
first people to really take to cars were bank robbers because the police were still on horseback. And so they got cars and they could run away. Um, uh, so that's absolutely the case. And so we need to have the right regulatory uh, response. Um, the, I think, cool thing is that I don't think it's a challenge. I think that we already have a regulatory regime that has served us well for decades that is, you could just drop it right in and it works, and it is how we treat cash. Cash, as you say, is more anonymous even than crypto, um, and we have a regulatory regime for that under the Bank Secrecy Act, and that's very simple. Financial institutions have to know their customers. They have to, if you take out $10,000 from a bank, you have to, you know, the bank has to report that to FinCEN, et cetera, et cetera. We can apply the exact same um, regime to crypto. And indeed, that is the regime that exists for crypto. A few minor things that could be done to improve it, but it's it's kind of the regime we have now. And so, but that, that also assumes you're going through regulated intermediaries, which some of the technology, I mean, you can do this on a peer-to-peer -peer yep. basis. And if that happens, it's going to fall outside of one of the intermediaries. The same that's way cash captured. Does. Right, yeah. right, right. Great. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll just make one final comment or question, and then we can open it up to questions from the audience. But um, a point about competitiveness and innovation. So we talked a little bit about Asia, and I was just poking around myself. And um, Binance is this huge exchange, and it, I think it's out of China. Um, and we're talking about, yes, China um, has a lot of money um, going through their companies, but they're also doing a lot in blockchain and, and open networks. Um, but one question that um, came up to me is, well, on these other networks coming out of Asia, who, who, who are holding the tokens? Like, the whales that hold the tokens really can um, move markets and manipulate markets on any of these open, um, open blockchains um, in crypto assets. So, in terms of risk and um, tr consumer trust, um, you know, the U.S. needs to stay competitive and innovate in this space. And maybe Asia is ahead. Maybe the U.S. is ahead. I don't know in terms of volume and um, and and growth in this space. Um, at least for gaming, like Samsung, they have a wallet on their phone now, um, a crypto wallet. I read that um, recently. Um, they announced that they would have like an engine coin, and and so there is like developments, and it's a global um, race to innovate, and so I guess that's kind of the backdrop to have light touch regulation to make sure that U.S. companies are innovating, but that um, you know there's also like safeguards and guidance and risk management. Um, so I don't know if you have any ideas about like the global. Um, uh, competitiveness of U.S. companies in this space versus Asia. Um, and then finally, we can open it up to questions. In terms of the international regulatory regime, I think one thing that has become clear to me as I've, as I've looked at international regulation is that the more, obviously the more financial services focused the, the jurisdiction is, the more likely they are to be a major player in this. But oddly, the larger the customer base in the jurisdiction, perhaps the more difficult it is for it to become a hub for crypto and blockchain technology. And that is because regulators suddenly become almost as concerned about consumer protection as they are about making their jurisdiction a hub for innovation and a dynamic economy and so on. So you see Switzerland and Singapore as emerging hubs, I think because these are historical financial centers, but also because regulators can be quite confident that a lot of what is developed there any consumer protection risks, to the extent that there are any, will fall on other people's plates, and they won't be blamed for them. Uh, whereas in the United States, in China, uh, to some extent, uh, perhaps in Russia, and certainly in the European Union, you have a much less clear situation in terms of what the priorities are for the regulator. And so we have, I think, much more regulatory clarity in those small specialist jurisdictions than we do. I mean, the Caribbean islands are another example of this, right? Um, that would be my, my reaction to, to your question. So do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, I'm Alan McQuinn, I'm with ITIF. My question's for you, uh, Jerry. I was wondering if you would expand upon some of the, the tax challenges that you see that you're 
uh, you briefly mentioned? Um, so we're um, actually going to be publishing a paper uh, in early April, um, just in time for tax day, uh, on this that will have sort of like the top five open questions on tax and some proposed uh, recommendations. Um, and I'll just give you a couple. Um, so uh, one that I think is, is sort of very important um, just for uh, uh, everyday use of this technology is the following. Um, it used to be the case that if you were a currency speculator and you bought a million dollars worth of euros, because you thought the price was gonna go up, and the price did go up, and then you sold it, um, you experienced a gain, and you had to pay tax on that capital gain. Okay. Um, but then it used to be the case that if you were going to, on vacation to France, and you bought $100 worth of euros, because you were going on vacation, and while you were in France, the price of the euro went up, and you bought a baguette, technically, you experienced a gain, because you disposed of your uh, 100, the, the euros you had bought, at a higher trading uh, uh, value. Um, and of course, and then w you experience a gain and meant that you technically should have um, uh, uh, kept track of that gain, reported that gain, and paid tax on that gain. And of course, nobody did this. Um, and uh, you obviously can't have a law that nobody is complying with, so Congress fixed it in the mid-90s. And they created a personal um, uh, uh, de minimis exemption uh, for for uh, foreign currency transactions, um, anything under three hundred dollars, any transaction under three hundred dollars in foreign currency, you don't have to keep track of or report or pay taxes on. Um, so that's great. We need that for crypto. It does not exist for crypto, and we need it because number one, if you want this for payments. So if I buy Bitcoin today, um, and then a month from now, the price of Bitcoin has gone up, and I use my Bitcoin to pay for coffee and Starbucks, uh, in a few months we'll begin to accept Bitcoin for coffee. Um, if I pay for my coffee with Bitcoin, I th I'm in that situation where I technically need to report that I've made a two cent gain because I bought my coffee with appreciated Bitcoin. Um, and so of course you can see how this creates friction for the technology. But it's not just buying coffee because quite frankly I don't think we're gonna be using Bitcoin to buy coffee uh, uh, in any prevalent way in the US or in the developed world. Um, but if you want to use the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network to run a smart contract, to do anything else on it, you have to pay a fee, a mining fee to the network. And those are transactions that are typically like pennies or sub-penny transactions that technically you would have to pay tax on. So um, last Congress, um, uh, Congressman Polis and Congressman Schweikert um, uh, put together a de minimis exemption uh, bill for cryptocurrency. Uh, which we're looking to reintroduce um, this Congress, um, and I think that would be great. So that's one big one. And then some other ones um, have to do with um, understanding what your basis is. Um, so for example, there's uh, uh, a bill that uh, also Congressman Emmer uh, has been working on that would um, create uh, kind of an exemption for hard forks. So if you have Bitcoin and Bitcoin forks, now you have Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Um, did, is that a gain? If it's a gain, when is it a gain? Is it when you, when, when the fork happened? Is it when you had access to the coins? Is it when you disposed of the coins? Um, so that's another one. But there, there, there are lots of little ones like that. I think I, uh, you have time to say more questions. Uh, this, sorry, you hear me right. Uh, just uh, two questions. Uh, first one, um, uh, you, um, Mark talked briefly about supply chain, and I'm just curious a little bit more about, I've also heard anti-counterfeiting um, as an application for, for blockchains. I was wondering if anybody on the panel could talk a little bit about that, um, some of the applications that you're seeing. Walk you through briefly through supply chain uh, on our side, and um, the trade lens application we have with Maersk, and the concept, and, and I did not realize this until I got into a good discussion with UPS about this. Um, so you all know the paper flow, uh, when we have a global supply chain, is very archaic, right? And what ends up happening, and we love to use the word tulips, 
right, to, to talk about value. But if, if you ship wildflowers from Kenya um, and you have a manifest to them, they go from Kenya to Amsterdam, then they get routed around the world. Well, the paper for all of that goes ahead, right? And the paper is resolved manually. And the process of manually resolving that can take a full day for one person, right? And then the paper then is flown again ahead to the next port, right? You can kind of put together the idea of what the expense is, right? And so what Maersk came up with was the concept of uh, smart contracts and building a network to move those transactions real time, okay? Uh, and then to allow something not to be kept at a port for any length of time, if you imagine wildflowers will spoil, right, because someone hadn't finished the manifest and, and moved the paperwork. Uh, the savings that they realized uh, in double digit percentages, the challenges that they realized is negotiating this with um, each port of entry, each customs bracket to say, will you adhere to us using this type of technology and we're meeting your current rules and regulations? So when I talked about guardrails, um, that's the negotiation piece that comes up, that we have to sit down, Merck has to sit down with each government around the world and say, you tell me your rules, I negotiate with you, we will follow your rules, they will be built into the smart contract language that we execute and we can follow it. Some countries move quicker than others. It's, it's funny that the, um, the, the countries in Asia Pacific move very quickly on it, right, because they're used to the change, right? Um, everybody was pretty much on board. Um, we have obviously trade issues with China, so that kind of put a, a pause on it. Um, but the efficiencies that are seen in a closed network of doing this with willing parties who will work together has been extremely productive, right? And you're beginning to see copies of it being done by other shippers as well uh, because of the efficiencies that they can realize on the market, because of the savings from theft, from spoils. Uh, we're realizing a significant change in how we do business digitally, right? And getting away from paper manifests. Uh, same thing I'd say you, you could see with food trust and the food trust network. Uh, not just Walmart, you have Carrefour, Dole, Unilever, all joining together and saying, I am going to move product globally. And the real issue is really when it comes to a fresh product as to how, what was the last recall we had? Now is it Turkey, right? I think recently we had a Turkey recall. Um, and the, always we have spinach, or let, not spinach, lettuce, mm -hmm. lettuce recalls, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you can begin to pinpoint the actual source and location of the spoiled lettuce, you're not recalling back entire batches that were produced in a time frame. That's what we're trying to trying to get to. Uh, as to counterfeiting, I'm, I'm always skeptical when I hear about counterfeit, anti counterfeiting, counterfeiting uses of blockchain because the hard part is how do you tie the physical thing to the entry on the blockchain? Well, let me give you an example of one where it could work, uh, and that's with diamonds. So when you have a diamond, um, looking at it under a microscope, it has a particular, I don't know how it works, but it's a particular pattern that you can see um, that um, is unique to the diamond, kind of like a fingerprint, and you can encode that in such a way that you can put it on the blockchain. And this goes back to the mutability, where you don't want it uh, to be changed. And, and so you can imagine that you are either a producer of a diamond or you are a nonprofit um, that can attest to the social responsibility or the non-conflict status of a diamond. And you can say, this diamond was produced by De Beers at this place, this is not a conflict diamond, it's et cetera. And then at any point in the future, 100 years from now, somebody can come across this diamond in the store, look at it, look up that pattern on the Bitcoin blockchain, and know its status. So, so and just I pick a, up on, well, they have well, a pick up on that, on Everledger, that, that's what we do with De Beers, is to identify a, a diamond that way. So, and it also, on conflict minerals, we, we're discussing that doing it in countries that have minerals that we don't necessarily want to trade with, the same pattern. So, same so the other element of this, which, which we've seen before, some, some basic prototypes, is this ties to this idea of like Internet of Things, right? So, so the point that you guys are highlighting is that's great that you can scan a box, 
But if you can't ensure that no one's tampered with the box, then it's not that valuable. Sure, you can show that the box got from point A to point B, but did someone change the, the inputs? Some of the technologies I think you're gonna see come out of this are like tamper resistant, like little chips. And I've actually seen some prototypes of this. It's pretty neat. Like so if someone were to tamper with the box, that could communicate immediately to the blockchain and say something's happened to this box. So uh, it'll be really, at warehouses in general, you could start to do that, because early days through Lab CFTC, people were coming in saying, we're gonna be able to transform you know, how ag products are being moved and show that there's no theft or loss. Or, and this was always the question we were asking, well, how do you know? I mean, like at the end of the day, it's only as good and truthful as the person who's scanning and saying, this thing arrived. I can picture these future states where we'll probably develop the tools to be able to weigh, measure, detect tampering, um, so I actually think in the counterfeiting uh, field, I, I've not thought a lot about that, but I can see it as an area that's that's pretty interesting, actually. Now, Sarah, they, they get excited on this question because we, we actually have technology that um, we can apply to an iPhone. Like you said that um, spectrometers that actually look at the fiber content, we, we say of mangoes, and we can source where they were actually planted, right? And when they get onto the ships, they use RFID tags to lock them down. But someone can say, well, no, my mango came from, uh, let's say, West Africa. No, it really didn't. It came from Chile, right? We can identify that using the technology. So we've gotten down to that point. So in counterfeiting, we can see we're on a food product down to the fiber content. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, my question is for you, Mr. O'Reilly. You brought up a really interesting and thought-provoking question. What is the responsibility um, for those that create private systems, and private blockchain systems, you know, if there was breakdown, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, from a regulatory standpoint, how would you approach that question? Because, you know, as you mentioned, if you're going to have a couple of big private systems upon which smaller firms rely on, that's essential. I mean, that's really at the core of... of of the situation. So how would you approach the responsibility aspect uh, well, for software development? Yeah, we're, we're going through that now. And when I started the discussion and I said, you know, the responsibility we look to for you all is to help us have ongoing discussions about the regulations that you have in a particular industry. As a member of that industry decides they want to digitize this technology, what are we doing to make sure we don't step on ourselves? with the regulations that are in place and make sure that the code that we built follows the pattern of the regulation of that government, right? That takes a lot of work. I, I will tell you, um, and I'm going through it now with, with one company, you have to get all of your partners that are within that industry to sit down and say, yes, we want to have this discussion. And then we put together what the requirements are as to what we see the regulator has, let's say in the United States, and we have to go to that regulator and sit down and have the conversation about it. It's no different than financial services. Um, we have challenges there as we all do, but it's, it's the same with any industry. How do you get uh, Customs and Border Patrol? How do you get the FDA? How do you get the USDA? Um, how do you get the financial services players to sit down and say, look, you're building a network, let me tell you where the guardrails are and how we should apply to them. And that's where I think you all as staff people can help facilitate these discussions. So as I said in the beginning, we're not having them now. We walk out of this room, everybody forgets about it, then something bad happens. Everybody gets up in arms, right? And you wanna have a hearing about why did this happen, right? That's, that's like reactive, right? And we really, we really wanna be prescriptive, right, and get ahead of this. So that's where you could help. So Mark, I, I would say, you know, the one area that that's hitting us is in the context of regulatory reporting. So there's this, you know, we, we actually our chairman has been pretty vocal about the idea that if market participants were to utilize some type of DLT network and want to use that as a way to satisfy reporting requirements, that could actually be a real win-win for both of us. And, and to unpack that a little bit more, you know, right now market participants in a fairly, you know, analog way batch and push data to us as an agency. Um, and then the agency is getting all of this da data in, in a non-standardized format. They're not standardized fields. It's very difficult for us to consume. So this idea that you would have this 
you know, this shared system where you have agreed standards and formats where the regulator could be a node, we could be seeing the information real time in, in a format where it doesn't have to be pushed to us because we're seeing it live. That could be very valuable potentially to us as well. So one of the things that we've asked and that we try to do through these, um, we have been called the Technology Advisory Committee, it's a FACA committee, um, you know, thanks to legislation that allows us to do this. We want, we have a subcommittee focused on DLT and one of the questions that we tried to pose to them is whether there are any, you know, is, is there friction, is there any ambiguity in our rules where you, you're not sure whether regulatory reporting requirements could be solved through a DLT system and, and if so, you know, we'd be interested in looking at that to make sure that our rules are tech neutral and agnostic as to how you're satisfying the requirements. So I think there's opportunities too for these kinds of conversations, you know, w with the agencies to, to, to look at the rule sets, figure out where the technology may bang into existing rules that envision the manual push of data or batching of data. Great, I think that's it. Thank you to the panelists and we'll continue this discussion later.